Thank you for that very generous introduction, and uh, thanks uh, for inviting me to give this talk. Um, this is a very different talk from what you just heard, and um, uh, it's very little data because we are just starting out, and, uh, but I wanted to get you very excited about this uh, new uh, initiative um, you know, called H3 Africa, uh, Human Heritage and Health in Africa. It's extremely exciting for us, but um, uh, just to give you a brief history of where this is coming from, uh, it's really, um, as you hear in my introduction, uh, the press, I just stepped down actually as the president of the African Society of Human Genetics. We are in the process of trying to elect a new president. Uh, but uh, during my 10 years uh, there as the president uh, of the society, uh, we were very worried that there's a lot of excitement, even in my own lab and my colleagues, was going on in terms of genomics, uh, but um, very little was playing itself out on the continent of, uh, of Africa. Uh, most of the activities that you were hearing about genomics in Africa was actually as a result of samples leaving Africa and the work being done outside of Africa. So we were very, very concerned about that, and we started discussing the whole concept of why don't we have maybe something called the African Genome Project uh, that will bring some attention uh, to actually do, being able to do this kind of work on the continent of Africa uh, with African investigators and, and their government heavily invested uh, in the process so it can be sustained uh, over time. So that's the sentiment you, you see in the first part of, my, uh, uh, of, of, of these slides, which is basically saying, uh, with tomorrow's medicine work for everybody, uh, as we continue to use genomics uh, to define therapeutic strategies, uh, we have to make sure that all human populations are indeed present. We share a lot of things together, uh, as you see in that picture too. Uh, we all were present, I'm not sure if I'm using, okay. Uh, it's very well documented now that we all started somewhere in Africa, and we are very highly mixed. But we also carry things, like you see in Sandonia and different other places, that are local. They have no hard time to spread. So we have to make sure that we adequately represent our human populations uh, in, in, gen in genomic studies. Uh, again, I'm sure, again, people in this room are very familiar with this chart here, that most of the GWASs that have been done so far, um, and most genomic studies, actually, have been done in non um, uh, in European populations and uh, African populations really have been minimally involved uh, either as investigators or even as uh, participants. But again, the numbers are changing uh, for good reasons. So um, as part of this African uh, society uh, meeting uh, in 2007 in Cairo, uh, where we were very lucky and we were able to invite uh, Francis Collins uh, that you see in the middle there. Uh, or the child who is now the, uh, he was the um, uh, director of the Genome Institute then, but now the director of NIH. Uh, we were able to engage him uh, to say, hey, the, this genomic uh, excitement is really flying over Africa and that we need to change this in a way that um, uh, we can get the continent more directly involved. And also, within that period, there was a uh, publication from, the, um, from uh, WHO, which also highly uh, encouraged the local participation of genomics uh, in genomic studies, uh, uh, with the idea that genomics may present opportunity to uh, leapfrog uh, some of these uh, countries uh, in terms of their own biomedical research and also healthcare. So as a result of our discussions, um, we were able to engage the, um, uh, the Wellcome Trust and the NIH. Um, and in 2010, um, again, you see the transition. We were thinking about uh, African Genome Project. Uh, but in that discussion, and uh, making sure that we actually make this a medically relevant uh, discussion, uh, it, it, it took on with contributions for very uh, many experts. Uh, different names, uh, which, which we now call H3 Africa, and it was formally announced uh, in June 2010 in London. Um, and uh, just to identify these guys, you see Francis Collins there, and also um, Mark Wopot, who was the um, uh, lead of uh, Wellcome Trust then, uh, he has since stepped down, and also Eric Green, who's now the director of the uh, Genome Institute, 
uh, myself and uh, Bongani Mayosi, who is the chair of medicine uh, in Cape Town, University of Cape Town. So we were very excited when this happened. And uh, at this point, I think it was a $35 million project uh, to engage uh, uh, the, uh, the continent. Uh, we weren't very, very sure uh, how all of these things were going to play out because there was really no roadmap uh, you know, to follow. So it was really left up to NIH and the Wellcome Trust to use their various mechanism uh, to, make this, uh, to make this happen. So why um, part of the justification while we're discussing all of this uh, is really that uh, engaging Africa or engaging global populations or creating more diversity is not just political correctedness only. It's really a scientific imperative. Um, as you've seen in previous presentation, we do learn different things as we go to different parts of the world. Uh, again, we all share a lot of things, but certain things are still local. And especially for the African uh, uh, contribution to human history, for me, it has always been very, very uh, interesting and to some extent disturbing that if we were actually interested in understanding human evolutionary history as it relates to the genome, as it relates to human health, uh, that and if all the playing field was level, that we would have started in Africa and then work out, again, given our history. But the fact that we have not adequately represented Africa in these discussions and, and the sampling strategy and all that, to me, I think it's, 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 uh, it's, it's not serving science very well. Of course, it's not politically correct either. So uh, these are some of the characteristics in terms of the African. Uh, most of you here are very familiar with this, so this is um, not news. Uh, the high genetic diversity, uh, low LDs, uh, no smaller haplotype, and uh, fine mapping. Again, uh, you know, TCLF7 uh, that was talked about in terms of type 2 diabetes. That was actually our first direct way of using the African uh, genome uh, you know, to inform uh, specific variants that may be underlining um, uh, a disease. I remember my collaboration with DECO Genetics when that paper was published in Nature Genetics, uh, that by bringing a West African cohort uh, to, uh, to inform the Icelandic uh, finding, we were able to narrow down uh, what we thought was actually the variant underlining that signal. So the, again, that was a very good demonstration of how you can use the African genome to inform this. So we think that by bringing this H3 Africa to fruition, that we are going to do more of this and we'll have more opportunity to use that history uh, in a way to, uh, uh, to inform what we are, all the GWA studies and other genomic studies going on in different parts of the world. And also, of course, that long history also calls for admixture mapping. Uh, again, uh, I, when I show these uh, different colors of uh, skin complexions, as you go from south to north uh, and east to west in Africa, you do represent just about what you see across all human spectrum. And I think we can do more um, and understand human biology by engaging Africa uh, a whole lot more. So what is the vision for H3 Africa? It's really to, to develop uh, state-of-the-art uh, laboratories and, and, uh, and, and data analysis strategy and repository uh, by engaging African scientists, who, of course, we collaborate with their colleagues in Europe and North America, Asia, uh, to sample Africa in a way that it will inform health in Africa, and then to use that to train uh, young African scientists uh, so that they can be active participants in biomedical research and specifically in genomic studies. And then to do this in such a way that H3 Africa becomes a global good. And I'll talk a little more uh, about that. Because apart from engaging Africa, Africa also needs to give to the world, uh, to, needs to contribute to all the efforts that is going on in the world to understand human history and human diseases. So we have these different components. So there are centers that have been developed um, and a bio, a bioinformatics network uh, going across different parts of the continent and also biorepository uh, in a way that uh, samples and data will be uh, adequately uh, shared and uh, curated. I'll, I'll talk a little more about that. So what are some of the key aspects of uh, H3 Africa initiative? 
One of the things that we thought was really critical, uh, again, in this process, is to empower the African scientists to be full, full members and players in this uh, development. So there was real effort to make sure that the money was awarded to an African investigator in an African institution that can form collaboration whichever way they feel, see fit to make the science happen. So that was real empowerment um, uh, in, you know, in that regard. <clears throat> and, and to develop uh, centers uh, that will involve uh, different parts of the Africa. One of the things that was also very common practice on the continent of Africa is that African scientists did not talk to each other. African scientists spoke with scientists in the West, in scientists you know, uh, outside of Africa, uh, because that's where the money was, and that's where the collaboration was. So you see that uh, they were not harnessing the power that existed within the continent just because they were sort of following the money. And then of another thing also, the science was not being defined locally. It was being defined by whatever, whoever has money that is coming to Africa to do work. So again, that's uh, part of the things that we we're also trying to, uh, to address here. And we felt that there must be adequate development of biorepository so that the next generations of African scientists and global scientists can come to Africa and see where these resources are and be able to engage uh, in the resources that have been highly, highly standardized and in a way that they can do their good science and also to create opportunity for data storage and data analysis um, um, you know, that will be global, uh, of global standard and people can use. And also wanted to make sure that a major emphasis of this is training, 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 training. Uh, one of the things that is highly missing uh, when I travel across Africa is mentorship. You know, when you don't have mentors, you know, young people find it very, very difficult. Uh, you know, to, to, for their career to go forward. We all know how it is important to, to as a postdoc, to be in a good lab and to have a good mentorship. And that mentorship can be for life. I still have my mentor up to today, um, uh, you know, and I still talk with him about different things. Again, those are very, very important uh, things. And we also wanted to make sure that as we develop the ethical standards uh, for all of this study, that they are informed by local cultures and practices. So what, what are some of the funded uh, projects uh, so far? Again, this is just a short list. Um, and if you go on the H3 Africa website, it's h3africa.org, uh, you will see a more comprehensive listing of some of these, uh, of this project. It, it, the H3 Africa now has gone from 35 million or so, or 38 million, to now $75 million. One of the interesting things that is playing out is people like success. So H3 Africa is now being seen as a success story and is beginning to attract more uh, funding. And also, when we started, only about two or three institutes at NIH were participating. That has since grown, and it's going to keep growing uh, uh, you know, in terms of uh, you know, uh, funding and opportunity to do this work. We are, just, we are close now to the next five years. It's been funded for five years. So I think renewal for the next five years is coming up very shortly. And I'm very, very hopeful, given the demonstrated success story so far, uh, that um, uh, it will be uh, picked up again. You know, we'll keep our fingers crossed. Uh, so those are some of the examples uh, of, the, uh, of the studies. So there's a stroke study, there's diabetes study, and there is um, uh, TB. And again, diseases that are indeed very important to, on the African uh, continent. So, these are specific research. What you saw before were centers. Uh, again, I'm not going to go through all of this, but just to give you a flavor uh, that most of these diseases are indeed uh, diseases that are causing a lot of um, uh, human suffering on, on the continent of Africa. And uh, we hope that by engaging in this, we will be able also to inform uh, these diseases in non-African uh, uh, populations. Okay. So biorepository, as I spoke about that earlier, this is a critically, critically important resource because what you typically will see, uh, again, I've been doing research now uh, in different African countries for many, many years, uh, is you go to a specific site, you see a little refrigerator, and you see an excess spreadsheet and trying to track these samples, and it's just 
it's a very difficult thing to do. So we are trying to create, and, and we, you know, with very varying degrees of success so far, uh, a biorepository that will be of world-class standard that you can be sure that if you get samples from there, it will have all the necessary documentation and standard uh, that you can be confident uh, to use in your own laboratory. So, and we are hoping to create regional um, biorepository, not just one. And then there's also a thinking that some of those resources may indeed be stored outside of Africa as a backup, uh, again, uh, to make sure that uh, when there's disaster, um, uh, you know, uh, we don't lose everything. An equally re important resource is bioinformatics. You can't really do genomics, or you can't really empower African scientists to be full partner in genomic research if they cannot analyze the data, if they cannot even structure the data. And so this is a, a very, very important, and I'm extremely happy to say it's one of the most successful aspects of H3 Africa. And, and as you will see in a, in a minute, in uh, the footprint that it now has all over uh, the continent with nodes uh, from south to east and uh, uh, as, you know, south to north and um, uh, east to west, all over the continent and engaging young men and women um, you know, in bioinformatics. So this is an extremely a successful story. So there is the NIH funded aspects, that's what I've been describing. This is the Wellcome Trust funded aspect uh, of H3 Africa, uh, looking at rheumatic heart disease and also um, uh, looking at uh, uh, trypanosomiasis and type 2 diabetes. The type 2 diabetes project, I'm also directly involved in that as an investigator. Um, and the goal there is to, uh, again, sample about 11 African uh, you know, communities uh, to enroll close to about 26,000 individuals to look at you know, uh, the genetics of type 2 diabetes. So that's, again, uh, ongoing uh, work. So I want to say that uh, this is a recent publication in science, uh, again, uh, what we consider the marker paper uh, for, for H3 Africa. Um, I put this here again just to tell you that, um, or to reemphasize the point that H3 Africa is already a success story. Um, and wh why do I say that? I think this is the publication list for this marker paper. I, I, I think it would be extremely rare to see another publication in the top science paper uh, that has so many Africans as co-authors. And to me, when I started thinking about uh, in the African Genome Project or H3 Africa, one of the things that I did was to actually to search and look at journals like Science and, and Nature and, and see how many of them actually have African as first author. And it's, it's almost zero, you know. There are some, but it's almost zero. And, and so for me, this is not a, a data-driven publication, but you can see that by this publication alone, we've changed our statistics quite radically, uh, you, know, <laughs> you know. And we hope that when the data start coming out, uh, it will even create more, you know, uh, opportunity uh, for young men and women on the continent. Uh, again, this is not to exclude anybody from other parts of the world, because like I said earlier, H3 Africa has to create a global good that all of us uh, you know, can use. But I think we are beginning to make a difference. This is uh, the map that accompanied the science publication. And um, what you will see here is what we call the footprint of H3 Africa. And uh, there's really this is unprecedented for Africa, really, where you have one initiative cutting across so many national boundaries, engaging so many uh, cultures uh, on the continent and, and so many nations. Um, it, it's, it's really, really um, um, a new phenomenon, and we are hoping that this will be the beginning of something even much larger, and we are beginning to see that also with the recent initiative from the Wellcome Trust uh, where African scientists and African institutions are, are now being uh, given the opportunity to show what they can actually do in terms of being leaders 
uh, uh, in, in establishing biomedical research. So this is a wonderful thing here. I'm not going to go through the details of this, but what you do see is that there are many nations that are participating, and within nations, there are many institutions uh, that are indeed participating. And uh, we are hoping that this will be a, a lasting legacy that will break down boundaries. One of the immediate implications of this is the process of informing uh, informed consent and also getting ethics approval. H2 Africa is educating and being educated by engaging different ethics boards across the continent. You, you, it's unbelievable how diverse the thinking behind these processes. And we are beginning to do it in such a way we are now putting some kind of uniformity across uh, these various ethical approval. Um, from, from our own personal experience, uh, you see sometimes it's taking me close to two years trying to get ethical approval from Ethiopia, and whereas you know, in a place like Nigeria or Ghana, it, it can take you, you know, a couple of months. You know. So you can see the high variability, and national uh, regulations are also very different. Some nations now don't have, allow for samples to be taken out. So we are trying to harmonize all of that uh, in a way that um, uh, we will do more, uh, more work. Again, this is just part of the criteria that we put in the science paper in terms of how we would define success for H3 Africa in five years. Again, publication in high impact journals uh, that reflect the contributions of African scientists and their collaborators uh, in a way that the African scientists uh, are not just uh, sample providers. That, to me, uh, will truly be the success story. And the flip side of that is my nightmare, and that is, H3 Africa becomes very successful, but when the publication starts to come out, you don't see the African investigators. That is my nightmare uh, you know, in this work. And uh, we think that is not going to happen, given the way it's been, uh, it's been set up right now. Uh, again, to increase the funding for biomedical research on the continent, uh, you know, create this uh, pan-African uh, way of uh, looking at bioinformatics network, um, and is already engaging nations to set up their own infrastructure that feeds into this uh, central uh, uh, bio network, bioinformatics network. And then to um, perhaps maybe the, the last one there is perhaps maybe one of the most important, to, to be able to secure another five years of funding uh, from the Wellcome Trust and the NIH, I think will be critically important. Why, we are, why the H3 Africa will be engaging other potential funders. Uh, uh, and we are beginning to see uh, other potential funders that may come under this umbrella. Uh, like I said, success is good, and people want to be able to, to, be, to be confident that when they give money, that the money will be used for what is, is, uh, is uh, proposed. So this is a recent paper in Nature. Um, um, which was a collaboration between um, uh, Sangha uh, and, um, and uh, also at NIH and a lot of African investigators. I regard this as one of the early success stories also of H3 Africa, although it's not a direct H3 Africa publications, but a lot of the African investigators that participated and contributed resources to this effort are members of the H3 Africa. And, and you can see that being able to involve uh, the African population is already informing our ability or comprehensiveness to do imputation uh, for uh, African ancestry populations and hopefully uh, for the global populations. So if you look at this, uh, 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 this, this chart here, just again as a, a quick uh, um, uh, display of how expanding our reference database uh, really can help us uh, in terms of just imputation accuracy. What you see here, the, the red line here, the Igbos uh, in the um, eastern part of Nigeria, because again, the Yoruba, we are act, act, you know, active participants in HapMap and also the Thousand Genome. Um, you know, I was the principal investigator that, again, participated in the HapMap and Thousand Genome for the Africa in that. You see that the Igbos, there's really no major improvement uh, you know, in terms of imputation by incorporating the AGVP uh, data with the thousand genome because their haplotype structure has been well you know, represented. But it is not true for, for SOTO uh, where 
if you just look at the thousand genome alone, you see again the degree of efficiency right here. But when you integrate the AGVB paper, uh, uh, data with the thousand genome, you see that you really do improve on the imputation um, success and accuracy. So again, just a, um, um, one demonstration of how what I was saying earlier, that it's not just uh, political correctness, it's also a scientific imperative that we engage all human populations in our effort. So what are some of the um, uh, informed consent issues and also data sharing issues? The guiding principle behind H3 Africa is really broad data sharing. So everybody that's participating as investigator has accepted and buy into the whole concept of data sharing. But that data sharing has to occur within some very specific uh, you know, ethics approval and framework. So what are some of the guidelines? Again, th these details are actually available on the website. Um, you know, so, but these are just some of the um, uh, highlights that I wanted to, uh, to share with the, uh, uh, with the group here. Again, is to, we are taking the um, philosophy of the NIH and the Wellcome Trust in terms of data sharing, and now we are building on that from an African perspective uh, to make sure that we indeed share data. Uh, I'm very, very um, um, happy that H3 Africa is indeed going to contribute uh, to the global good in terms of genomic research. So we want to maximize the availability of the H3 Africa data in a timely manner, perhaps more importantly, that the data is of good quality to be shared. We can make data available, but if it's not of good quality, nobody will come. Uh, you know, so the data has to be of extremely good quality, and then we have to make sure that it's timely and, and that it's, less, it's as less cumbersome as possible to be able to download and use the data as possible. But we have to protect the rights and privacy, just like in any cohort of individuals who participated in the study. Uh, you know, we have to recognize the scientific contributions of the African investigators who generated this resource. That's one of the points I made earlier. Um, and that, you will see that that is reflected in the embargo uh, structure that has been put in place that I will share uh, in, in a minute. Uh, because the African investigators, in a sense, are not going to be able to run as fast as investigators in Canada or in the UK or in the US. Okay? Um, and to ensure that all ethical guidelines are followed and, uh, and whenever possible, again, to deposit this data in places like EGA, um, you know, so that it can be broadly shared. So this is the embargo structure uh, that have been put in place in terms of data sharing. The data will invariably end up in EGA. Um, I think all of all, all the investigators have indeed accepted this, uh, but um, when the data is, is being uh, generated, within two months of the generation of that data and QC, uh, is deposited into the um, H3 uh, Africa Bionet. Uh, where more data structuring and cleaning is done, and it stays within that structure for about nine months. Um, again, giving opportunity for the data to be analyzed and, and, and used. Um, and then is de it will be deposited in the EGA. And, and when it's deposited in EGA, there will be a 12-month embargo uh, there before the data is used, uh, you know, so that the African investigators have adequate time uh, to analyze the data and answer their primary questions uh, before the data is indeed uh, released for, um, uh, for sharing. But within these 12 months, individual can apply they just can't publish uh, uh, the, the, their results <clears throat> within the same. So in total, it's about 23-month 23, 23, uh, period uh, that we are looking at uh, in terms of um, from when the data is generated to when it becomes uh, publicly you know, available. And we feel this is quite reasonable, uh, given the limited resources that the African investigators are going to have uh, to be able to analyze this kind of data. So these are the type of data that will be generated. Uh, again, a lot of these studies are clinical studies, so they're going to have the, cl the, the classical uh, data structures uh, that um, um, uh, you typically see in a clinical study and also epidemiological study, the demographic, anthropometric data, 
disease and health related type phenotypic data. And there's a strong effort within the history of Africa to harmonize the, the phenotype data uh, so that these studies, they can share information and can collapse and increase sample size across all of these various studies. There's going to be uh, effort. We are actually in, in discussions now with um, different um, um, uh, biotech companies, Affymetrix, Illumina, and others uh, in terms of generating uh, an African you know, um, informed uh, GWAS chip, uh, something like along the line of the mega chip that is currently available, but maybe something even more comprehensive. Now we have more sequence data from different parts of Africa to inform uh, the design of that chip. So that's going to be, again, one of the achievements, I think, of H3 Africa. So there will going to be a GWAS type data, there are going to be sequence type data uh, available, and there's um, also going to be data because there's uh, a microbiome project uh, taking place in Nigeria and I think in Zambia also um, that will generate um, both uh, human and uh, uh, micro, you know, microbes uh, you know, genome. Uh, in that regard. So again, very, very many types of uh, um, uh, samples and, and data will be available under this umbrella. Okay. Now, this um, guiding history of Africa, we have a very robust uh, team of experts, and two of them are in this room, uh, Norex and also uh, Philip, um, and they've been very, very instrumental in guiding us uh, in, you know, moving this whole project, you know, forward. And you see all the other colleagues there uh, who are actually helping and members of the expert committee uh, again. So Asia Africa has indeed been very, very blessed and, and, and uh, received some very uh, powerful uh, collaborations and advice from different parts of the world. So this was the fifth uh, Asia Africa Consortium meeting uh, that uh, took place recently in uh, Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. One of the things that makes me extremely happy uh, whenever I go, these are six months meetings uh, in different African countries. And I keep seeing people that I don't know or I don't recognize. To me, that is growth. And I'm always extremely happy, especially when I see the students and postdocs uh, coming to these meetings and being very hopeful. Uh, for the very first time, that they don't have to generate their own cohort uh, to be able to do their study and do their PhD work. So I'm extremely excited whenever I go to this meeting. The next one is going to be in Zambia, in Livingston. And if you're interested, um, um, I think it's uh, something that um, you may want to get in touch with the uh, History Africa folks and um, you know, see if, if you'll be able to participate. But there's one that is going to, the next one after that is going to be in Baltimore. Um, I mean, in, uh, at the NIH, um, and uh, History Africa investigators are also going to actively participate in the American Society of Human Genetics meeting that's going to take, <coughs> take place in uh, Baltimore. So that's what I wanted to share with you. Again, this is really exciting, and um, I hope you will become a part of the History Africa. Uh, this is the time to form collaborations with these investigators. This is the time to support them, and this is the time to build the bridge uh, in a way that we can expand uh, this whole effort. Thank you very much. So thank you very much for sharing with us this uh, success story, which seems also to be a love story between you, you and the people from Africa. So it's open for questions. We have time for two quick questions because we're really beyond time. Okay. Hi, Charles. Thanks very much for that. Uh, really quickly, across the projects, um, how many patients, participants, et cetera, are being, will be uh, recruited or part of the uh, analyzed, genotyped, et cetera? Okay. Yeah, excellent question. I, um, I deliberately did not say that because I wanted to be, it, it, we are anticipating anywhere between 50 and 75,000. Uh, individuals will be enrolled as part of this first phase of, of, uh, of H3 Africa. And of course, if, if we get renewed for another five years, then that can significantly uh, you know, increase. Yeah. Other question? So maybe I'll just ask you a quick one. Okay. Since you, well, will you be recruiting 
like at many sites in Africa, or is it like uh, one site recruiting or many site recruiting at the same time because you're talking about 50,000 or 75,000? It's, it's, it's many sites across the, um, across most of the sites are in the region we call sub-Saharan Africa. Okay. Okay, so, but the uh, bioinformatics network extends all the way to North Africa also. But in terms of the clinic work and the epidemiological studies, most of those are based in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, but they are in different countries and different, uh, you know, communities. Um, for example, the type 2 diabetes project is going to engage, you know, close to 11, uh, you know, different communities in different countries. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, thank you.